Hi there, I'm Sherry Stock and I am one of the directors at Camp Kodiak and in the winter time I am a special education teacher in Ontario. Today we're going to talk about the ABCs of behavior and I want to be clear about a few things. When I say behavior I'm not referring to labeling children with a behavior problem. Behavior refers to any action that a person does that is observable to others and that behavior can be positive or negative. So Studying for your test, saying please and thank you, making your bed, those are as much behaviors as are swearing, slamming the door, having a temper tantrum. Uh, when we talk about the ABCs, they stand for antecedent behavior consequence. And this is not a strategy that will necessarily help you solve a tantrum in the middle. This is a way of analyzing the circumstances that tend to lead to different types of behavior that a child might be exhibiting. So that you can help them navigate the situations that they tend to find difficult and help maximize their opportunities for success. Today we're going to talk specifically about the antecedents. And in a subsequent video we'll be talking about the behavior and the consequences. And if I'm missing all my good friends I know they're up ahead just around the bear Tomorrow is sweet cause we're all gonna meet at Kodiak. As I mentioned, the A stands for antecedent. An antecedent is anything that happened before the behavior. And some people think of these antecedents as triggers, some people might call them stressors, but really it's anything that would have happened before the behavior that you observed. And there are seven common antecedents, and for ease of memory I've made a mnemonic and my mnemonic is sad webs. So the S stands for structure. Uh, does the child know what they were supposed to be doing at that time? Is there a lot of choice? Is there too little choice? Is there too much free time or too little free time? Do they know who they're supposed to go to for help? The A stands for attention. Is the child feeling lonely or excluded? Um, very often we hear people say, oh, this child is only doing this for attention, and the advice is to ignore it. And I think that's the wrong advice. If a child is telling you that they need attention, you need to find ways to provide that child with attention. The D stands for demands. So what was being asked of the child before the behavior started? And um, those demands could be emotional, they could be social, academic, or physical. So what do they need to do or perform before the behavior started? The W stands for waiting. Um, they could be waiting for a preferred activity. It could be transitioning. Uh, waiting can be very, very difficult for some children. The E stands for embarrassment. So did something happen before the behavior that uh, maybe it was a threat to their self-esteem or caused embarrassment. That could be something as simple as making a mistake. It could be losing a game. It could be teasing, either friendly or unfriendly teasing. Or it could be uh, public admonishment. The B stands for biological. Is there something inside the child that is causing them stress? Are they feeling hungry or thirsty? Are they tired or sick? Is the environment too hot or too cold? Um, those can cause stresses on a child. And the S stands for sensory. Is there something in the environment that's causing stress? So think about the five senses. Uh, are the lights too bright or are they too low? Is there, are there loud noises or maybe a persistent humming in the background? Is there a strong smell or taste? Is there something itchy? Uh, perhaps a tag in, in a child's shirt or socks. Um, are people too close to them? Is something too tight? Uh, all of those sensory uh, stimulations can be very, very stressful for some children. So once we can identify certain common antecedents or stressors that our kids experience before they have difficult behavior, we want to figure out ways to help them manage those stressors. Um, and in the short term, for some of them, it might be really appropriate to eliminate the stressor altogether. Uh, so for example, if your child uh, has difficulty with loud noises, 
then providing noise canceling headphones if they're going to be someplace noisy might eliminate that stressor and allow them to enjoy their day. Or if you know that hunger is very difficult to manage for your child, you might make sure that you always have snacks in your bag and that you're always prepared to give them something to eat in case they're too hungry to be able to function with the situation. And in the short term, it's really appropriate for your, the caring adults in your child's life to manage those stressors and eliminate them as much as possible. But we always need to think long term. What does this look like at age 8, 18, 28, 38? And ultimately, our goal always needs to be that children learn as much independence as they can handle. And so while we want to give them the comfort of knowing that the caring adults in their lives will take care of them and help reduce stress for them, we also at the same time need to teach them self-advocacy skills so they can start recognizing what situations cause them stress, what uh, solutions do we have that maybe they can implement themselves or they can self-advocate for with an adult who's in charge of the situation. In some cases, the stressor isn't something that we could practically eliminate, uh, nor is it really desirable to. For example, waiting. It's not our goal to eliminate all situations where a child is required to wait. We don't want kids to learn that they can get exactly what they want at exactly the moment that they want it all of the time. But what we do need to do is teach kids how to wait. We can't expect that kids know this instinctively. And we need to teach them through the use of support tools like perhaps first then boards where they've got a very clear uh, visual first I do my homework and then I play my video game or perhaps through schedule so they know exactly how long the wait is until they get the preferred activity. Um, it's also really helpful to start with very short periods of waiting for things that are not that um, exciting that the kid is really going to be too focused and too stressed by having to wait for them. So perhaps, you know, they have to wait to get their snack for 30 seconds or for a minute. And eventually you can extend that amount of time and extend maybe the excitement of the thing that they're waiting for. So ultimately, kids can learn that they will eventually get the thing that they want, um, but it can't always be at exactly the moment that they want it. At Camp Kodiak, we have a very structured schedule and routine and the kids really know what's coming next from one moment to the next and from one day to the next. But one day is quite different and it's the last Sunday of the summer and we call it Kodiak Games. And on that day, we have a completely different schedule, completely different routines and it can be very, very exciting and it is for most of our kids. But we know that for some kids, Kodiak games can be very stressful. Usually, for example, our, um, our dining hall is pretty quiet. We don't sing songs and play games in the dining hall because 300 people need to eat together. And the din of that happening is noisy enough. We want to make sure that we have a comfortable environment where people can sit and enjoy their food. On Kodiak games, it's a little different though. After most people have finished their meal, the cheering starts and there's, it's fun and it's raucous and it's loud and most people love it. But for some people, it's very, very stressful and even for some, it might be painful. So what we do is we have a table outside the dining hall and the kids that we can, either the ones that we can anticipate are gonna have difficulty or the ones who've asked us or told us that you know, it's difficult for them in the dining hall, they're allowed to eat outside with some counselors. They can still see and participate in the fun that's happening inside, but they can do it from a much more comfortable spot so they can enjoy their meal and not feel so stressed. And the same thing goes for the activities during the day. Um, you know, we're in much larger groups. You're not just with your cabin group, you're with a whole team. And the activities that we do are a little bit different and the rules are a little bit different. And even though we de-emphasize competition for most of the day, um, and that really the competitive activities are ones that the kids self-select, and they're not required at all, um, we know that the environment of the day, the cheering, the costumes, all of that uh, can be stressful for, for some kids. So we have an alternate location as well. 
and we call it the, the PlayStation. And in the PlayStation, uh, it's like a bit of a cooling station for the hot days. Um, there's connects, there might be Lego, puzzles, um, there might be chess, books to read, uh, craft supplies, and kids who need a bit of a quieter time either for a short period or even for a long period, are invited to go to the PlayStation. It's staffed by counselors who will help engage them, make sure that they're still doing something fun. And we encourage kids throughout the day to try to reintegrate into the fun that's happening outside for whatever parts of it are comfortable for them. So we want to make sure we include them in the fun of Kodiak games, but we want it to be fun and not stressful. And so we think about what might be pitfalls for our kids and we try to plan for them uh, so that all kids can really enjoy themselves. Now I said at the beginning that behavior can be positive or negative negative. and really the examples I've been giving you have been um, you know how to look at what the antecedents are to try to prevent tantrums or meltdowns those types of things but I think it's equally useful to use ABCs and look at what the antecedents are to positive or successful behaviors or interactions, especially if you're thinking about a situation with which your child has had difficulty in the past. So for example, if you know that play dates are usually really difficult for your child, but there's one specific child where the play dates are always smooth and successful, what you want to do is look at the antecedents to that play date. You know, is that at a certain time of day, perhaps right after a meal? Uh, so you don't have a hunger stressor. Is it uh, very carefully structured or is there a lot of free time? Uh, is it with just one child or are there multiple children? Uh, are the play dates at the other child's house or at your child's house? So take a look at what are the circumstances that tend to lead to a successful experience and then try to replicate those circumstances you know, in the future so that your child can have successful play dates uh, with other children as well. And this doesn't just go for play dates. This might be you know, with teachers at school or certain subjects at school or extracurricular activities that they've participated in. You know, why is it that soccer is always really successful but baseball is usually a minefield? And try to figure out what are the elements of, you know, of the soccer team, the coach, the practices, the structure, the teammates, you know, that make that situation successful and uh, how would you replicate that so that baseball is just as fun. So to summarize, we take a look at antecedents to figure out what comes before a specific behavior. So we can try to figure out what might trigger a positive or negative reaction in a child. And the seven common antecedents uh, are sad webs. So structure, attention, demands, waiting, embarrassment, biological, and sensory. Thanks very much. And as always, please reach out if you have any questions. Bye-bye.